Hello. Is that they play you on and they play you off? Um, in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election, liberal observers realized with horror how many people were willing to vote for an outspoken white supremacist, a misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, and otherwise hateful man. And they doubled down on the idea that empathy was the key to a more progressive political arena. Love Trump's hate became the rallying cry post-election, as it had been during Hillary Clinton's campa campaign, a slogan that placed the personal obligation to understand each other at the heart of a politics of resistance. It has continued as a banner under which this so-called resistance has organized in the wake of Donald Trump's inauguration. It's been premised on the idea that a greater understanding of the experiences of marginalized people would lead the US to a more perfect justice, more humane political leaders, fairer laws, and less bias in punishment, fewer police shootings of black and brown innocents, and generally less racism in our daily lives. Empathy is one of the things that makes us human and is a deeply important quality to cultivate. The problem with imagining it as a t useful tool for political transformation, however, is twofold. First, because as the work of Ibram X. Kendi and others demonstrate, racism did not come before institutions. Institutions created the need for racism. Racist ideas about black Africans were concocted in order to justify slavery. Slavery was not the product, but the origin of racism. As institutions and structures such as slavery continued to place black-skinned people in a debased position, racism became naturalized, practically invisible. Now, hundreds of years into the project of white supremacy, we must not fall into the trap of imagining that changing attitudes, cultivating empathy for the oppressed, will undo structures. The structures need to be undone in order to clear the conceptual and imaginative space for empathy to flourish. The second problem with considering empathy as a political tool is simply this. I don't want to wait for people to develop empathy for me until I am treated as a full human being. I <laughs> I don't want the fullness of your humanity to depend on my capacity for understanding either. Empathy is a personal transformation, not a collective act. It replaces political revolution with atomized notions of doing right by others. And when it is the basis for collective action, it can do as much harm as good. The colonizing projects of European empires and the Catholic Church in an earlier moment of globalization were motivated, or at least justified, by empathy, after all, by wanting to save people from their own darkness. A politics based on empathy imagines justice as something to be bestowed by newly enlightened individuals on other, lesser individuals and communities. If there is a politics of empathy, it is one that allows the person called on to be empathetic to remain in a position of supremacy, doling out justice as a matter of kindness. The idea that empathy is an antidote to cruelty is predicated on being able to fathom each other fully, to translate another person's experience into a reflection of one's own, to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Achieving this goal is often said to require us to hear people's stories. Such thinking underpins, to take one example, some of the most effective and affective artworks that have been made in recent years about the global migrant crisis, a crisis manufactured by the imposition of borders that has seen 68.5 million people forced from their homes, according to the UN. More than 25 million of these are classified as refugees. Many of the works I'm thinking of are based on first-person narratives by those who have had to flee and who find themselves either perpetually searching for safe haven or immobilized by borders and warehoused in provisional camps that have become increasingly permanent. Take, for example, Candice Bright, 
who asked Julianne Moore and Alec Baldwin to act out monologues based on slide interviews with six individuals from the Global South who had fled to safety. Or Carlos Mata's uh, beautiful work, The Crossing, who's, uh, that features narrations by LGBTQ people who discovered that their safe haven, Amsterdam, was not as welcoming as they'd hoped. Bushra Khalili, who asks refugees to trace their circuitous routes across borders and seas, simultaneously creating an oral history and a map of desperation. And Kutlug Ataman, whose video installation revolves around interviews with the Kurdish residents of a shanty town outside Istanbul, people who have had to escape their homes over generations. What does it take to shine a light on the devastating human and environmental costs of the hoarding of wealth and resources by an infinitesimally small global elite, a privileging of ease over life, human and non-human, closed and thickened borders, white supremacy and its attendant mechanisms, capitalism most of all, and so on, in order to evoke our empathy and thereby provoke our action? The answer, say these artworks and says our culture at large, is to ask those most affected by the crisis to speak, to open up about what has led them from home to not home. But what does it say about me, I wonder, that in order to have my empathy provoked, in order to spur myself to action, I require that these refugees do what they are compelled to do in front of immigration officers, whether in New York or Berlin or Athens or San Diego or countless other points of entry, to tell their stories, stories that include brutal rapes, tortures, beatings, painful family separations, daily humiliations, constant terrorizing fear, privation, losses of all sorts, in order to justify their right to cross borders and find safety. What does it mean if, in order to be empathetic, I ask people to tell their truths? What differentiates me, then, a person seeking to understand from border police, ICE agents, lawyers, judges, and so on? There are ways to make work about the injustices that face our species that do not invert, inadvertently reproduce the invasive systems of state verification that are meant to re-traumatize those who reach our borders. Many of these rely on storytelling, but of a fictional, even fantastical kind. Halil Altindere's Space Refugee, an ongoing project become, begun in 2016, takes the only Syrian cosmonaut, Mohammed Ahmed Faris, and his dream of starting a colony for refugees on Mars and turns it into a parafictional futurist proposition. Likewise, Andros Sins Brown and Karthik Pandian, in their two years and counting collaboration with the Syrian refugee Zachariah Al Mutlak, have de devoted themselves to develop work driven by Al Mutlak's narration of his biography. But the twist here is that they have no idea which parts of Zachariah's story are real and which parts are fictional. And so I stand here in front of you at a summit dedicated to speaking truth to say, freedom is also the ability to tell lies. It is the ability to claim fiction in the face of the state's demands that we reveal our truths. And so solidarity is rooted not in our capacity to cross divides and understand each other, but in the recognition that we have the obligation to care for others no matter what stories they tell about themselves, no matter if they refuse to speak, no matter if we have any sense of ourselves reflected in them. What would it mean if our politics were based not on our ability to empathize with people whose experiences are distant from our own, but on our willingness to care for others just by virtue of their being beings? A few years ago, desperate for a pet, my daughter convinced me to get her a chameleon. Now, chameleons are the most impossible creatures to anthropomorphize. They're like little dinosaurs. Their only emotions are fear and not fear. 
They don't recognize you or acknowledge you or perceive you as anything but a predator who occasionally provides them with food. After a few weeks of having this chameleon, feeding him disgusting live crickets every day, having him hiss and snap at her any time she got near him, not even being able to watch him because he's always hiding amongst the foliage, my kid came down from her room. I love Beppe! That's the chameleon's name, Cesare Beppe the Rock Johnson III Sedita, if you must know. <laughs> I love him so much. Love him, I asked. How can you love him? He doesn't seem very lovable. But mom, she said to me in all her 12-year-old wisdom, I've been keeping him alive for all this time. I've been taking care of him. How can you not end up loving something that you have to take care of?